When developing a game, the mechanics by which the player interacts with the game are vital in keeping them engaged and responsive. It's also an opportunity to show the player that the game was designed with them in mind. Now, I'm still waiting for Cooking Mama Fufu Edition, where you have to, you know, mix and pound the fufu flour. But that's not a thing just yet. And our next speaker is going to explain just why that is. Richard Terrell is an eclectic game designer. His study as a writer, musician, visual artist, and engineer allows him to design from broad life experiences. And he currently works as a senior game designer at Brass Line Entertainment. He's worked on games such as Remnant from the Ashes, Barabari Ball, and he is the sole developer of Enlighten, Learn the Art of Learning, a game that combines his biggest passions, games and learning. Now, go grab a snack, I'm gonna grab a bowl of jollof rice, and Richard is gonna explain why there's no such thing as black mechanics. Why there's no such thing as black mechanics. In this talk, I will be defining black mechanics. We're gonna consider a cultural recipe or what kind of conditions does it take in order for a cultural art to actually develop uh, within a people group? And then finally, we're going to look at our reality, which is basically uh, what is the current state of the video game industry and what kind of factors are at play in order to uh, have black mechanics or uh, black mechanics be created or not be created. So the definition of black mechanics is really important, and it starts with the word black. So what makes something black, right? So you see this, this object on the screen. Uh, if you know what it is, that's great. If you don't, it's a food object. It's called okra. And it is definitely what I consider to be a black food. And if you look at it, if you read the definition, really nothing about it says black. There's nothing on Wikipedia that says this is a black food. But the real key here is that the blackness is in its history. It's not in the food item itself. It's in how black people over time have used this food item as a staple as part of their cuisine, as part of their nutrition. So it, we're really looking at the history and not the objects themselves to determine blackness. So yes, essentially we have to understand where we come from in order to understand ourselves. History is very important here. So the next major uh, important concept here is mechanics, right? And there's two major definitions I wanna run by you. The first one being player actions from controller inputs, mechanics, or the second one is just a filler word that people use to describe just about anything in a video game. We're pretty much gonna lean with that first definition. I think it works for us a lot better. Uh, so when we're talking about mechanics, we're talking about these player controllable actions. And when you look at a control scheme like this, this is typically what you're thinking of. And if you look at these options from Super Smash Brothers, you know, none of these scream like black, none of these scream uh, Japanese, none of these scream any kind of particular race or people group. Jump, attack, special, those are all pretty common. So that kind of begs the question, like what are we actually looking for uh, when we're looking for black mechanics? So if we take the definition of mechanics and blackness, I believe what we're looking for are game actions that black game designers commonly use to communicate their unique shared history. Why do we need black mechanics in the first place? Well, so video games are obviously a very powerful medium. That's why you're here. That's why you're listening to this. It's why I make games. We all love video games, but we love them because they're so powerful as an art form. Uh, they communicate ideas and experiences, they communicate emotions and all these other crazy things that reflect the complexity of life itself. So we need to understand that video games are not made in a vacuum and nor are the creators of these video games. Everyone uh, has a history and every single thing that goes into a video game kind of has, has its origin, has its inspiration, has its connections to life itself. So life is pretty much the really important factor here. And it's really difficult to imagine liking video games as much as we do without imagining also respecting and liking the creators that made them come to life in the first place. So while we're also, as a people, trying to understand who we are, we create art to communicate that to other people. 
you wrap it all together and it's, it's basically we need black mechanics because black people are making video games because black people are on the planet and because just because right so it's really important for people to be able to find the tools and find the ways for the medium of their choice to communicate what they're trying to get across and if we look at video games there's a big kind of split to consider there's narrative elements and then there's sort of the systemic mechanic elements if you look at a random Google search of black video game characters, you'll get something like this. And I think it's great that uh, we have some representation in the industry right now. But the thing that always bothers me is that just narrative representation is a little bit precarious. It's, it's got, it's a little bit of a complexity there because it's really easy to take what you might consider to be a non-black context, just pluck out the character and put in a black person. And then all of a sudden it's like, great, we got a black story, but it goes so much deeper than that. Uh, life and history and context and culture and people groups is so much more complex than just a palette swap, if you will. So, uh, and there's also that other issue where it's really easy for non people of color to put people of color on the cover for like their main character or whatever. And then it's completely written and created by people who are not of color. Uh, that happens in the comic book industry. There's sort of a, a huge issue with that. And it can pretty much happen anywhere. So in our quest to understand really authentic authorship. We really need to combine black mechanics and black narratives to really give video games the best chance to represent black history. So now let's consider the cultural recipe. I think there are three major components in order for a cultural art uh, to actually emerge from a people group. You need limits, you need time, and we also need service. And I'll explain that right here. So when I'm talking about limits, I'm really talking about increasing the number of potential interactions within people. Like these, these kind of cultural arts develop uh, through a process, through uh, improvement over time. And the more interactions that people have, both making, sharing their tips, uh, exposing these things to other people, the, the more potential there is for that craft or that art to be refined. Uh, so it just also goes doubly for when there's a small range of things that they're actually working with. In terms of environment, if you're stuck in the city that you live in, you have to use the resources that are around you, uh, the food that's around you, the, the objects that are around you, and really physical location is a really great way to kind of uh, put boundaries on the kinds of things that people do and think and uh, work with. And that's a really important factor when we're considering what limitations help us create cultural arts. And the next one is time. Time is obvious. Uh, we need time to learn. We need time to pass on information. We need time to incorporate artistic elements that other people give us into our own lives. We need time to make it our own, uh, breathe it, live it, and then kind of express it back outwards. All these things take time, and it's not going to happen overnight. And we also need service. So service is where people within a community um, give back to themselves, right? So. When you're talking about, I have an art form, I believe it enriches our lives and I'm making it here. When they give that art form to other people within their community, they're enriching the lives of the people of their audience. And when that happens and it happens back and forth, you get this really powerful, positive feedback loop. Uh, not to mention that serving someone, especially in real life, right? Like when you have to actually physically go to a location uh, that models behavior, you see them doing it for you, you learn by seeing so it's a really human thing for people to serve and interact with each other. And it's something that we seriously should not underestimate. So let's look at a few examples real quick. Uh, black cuisine. We all know that there's black food. That's a thing. It's in our jokes. It's in rush hour. And there's an amazing Netflix series called High on the Hog in which uh, Stefan Statterfield sort of examines how African-American cuisine has transformed America. Highly recommend it. These next few uh, images you'll see is from that. But when I was looking at the first episode and other episodes from the series, it's pretty obvious that black cuisine really started from somewhere. And it started in these very specific conditions. On the left, we have the limitations of space where African people, uh, they are limited to the food that they can grow and the, the location that they are in and the, their ability to transport the food really creates all these limitations that allows them to focus on certain food elements. Uh, obviously, African people have plenty of time to do this. And they served each other food, which is one of my favorite parts about food. Every day we have to make and eat food. And it's an amazing opportunity for us to serve the people that we care about, the people within our community. And that's why just about every people group under the sun has their own particular kind of cuisine. So with all these factors there, it was no wonder that black food, black arts, black cuisine developed from our history. 
So we can look at something like jazz music. And there are plenty of black uh, jazz artists. And uh, we can tie the, take a look back into the history to see how this all started. But it's the same three conditions we're talking about. We have limitations of space. Jazz really started in New Orleans, and not just in the city, but in the red light district, where it was just a couple of blocks and 24-hour uh, activity in the brothels and so on. And musicians were just playing nonstop, right? So you got your limitation of space where you got a lot of musical talent all in one place. You give them about 20 years in the red light district before it shut down with all that concentrated activity. And then you consider that the very act of being a musician, uh, going up on stage, performing for other people, uh, entertainment, which, you know, it's, it's very much life affirming. It's very much life enriching when we listen to music and socialize and dance. So this is very much something that's sort of an important part of uh, our well-being. So they serve each other as musicians, both playing improvisationally and to their audience. And people like James Reese Europe, who fought in the war, uh, World War I, went over to Europe. And in addition to fighting a war, he and his, his group uh, performed jazz music all across Europe, even after the war, to spread uh, this particular style of Black music. And since then, you know, jazz has exploded. It's a worldwide thing now. And it all happened with this very particular kind of uh, starting conditions. And our last example is gonna be the DAP or the Black Handshake. You've probably all seen an example of this somewhere or another. It's on our TV shows, it's in our movies, it's on the streets. Uh, it's just something that's really interesting and obvious to observe. So it's interesting to think that even the DAP has its history sort of deep embedded into uh, this particular kind of recipe. So in the Vietnam War, uh, black soldiers were sent overseas to fight and there weren't a lot of black soldiers comparatively to anybody else. You know, we're a minority. That's usually how it is. Uh, so being in a foreign country and fighting in the war and being in this sort of perilous situation, these soldiers had to find a way to survive. And one way that they did is through solidarity and, and camaraderie with each other. So as a greeting, they invented this handshake and they used it to, to bond and to form strong ties uh, in the war. They bring it back home. And after the, the Vietnam War, it just kind of spreads and spreads and spreads. And it becomes a genuine, uh, complex expression within Black culture to do these particular kind of handshakes. So even something as seemingly simple as a handshake has its roots deep in our history and has all three of these conditions, limit of space because they're fighting in the war and they're overseas, time, Vietnam War, roughly 20 years, and service, helping each other get through these hard times. So with that recipe put down, with that said, I think we need to take a really hard look at what we have going on in the video game industry, which is our reality. And in the video game industry, we have, we're missing a few of these elements here. Like in terms of limits, time and service, we don't have it all uh, lined up like we should in order for black cultural arts to develop or really any cultural arts. But let's take a look at the first one. The modern gaming industry is not really an environment where cultural arts can develop. And if we take a look at these three pieces, we're going to see why in specific detail. For some who make video games in the industry, there's too many limitations. And when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, OK, professional developers, uh, they are in sort of a walled garden. And while there's a lot of talent and a lot of interesting things going on within the company, uh, their limitation is pretty much fixed to a single project. So in all the other cases, when we had multiple musicians, multiple uh, chefs, multiple cooks, they were all multiple individual people working on different kinds of projects and intermingling constantly every day, multiple times a day. But when you're talking about a video game, the singular project that's made over the course of multiple years doesn't get that same kind of back and forth and that interaction with everything else. So really a professional game studio environment is too strict. But on the other hand, indie devs are probably too, too uh, loose, too open. There's too many options. Uh, they are free to make games for any hardware they want, in any style they want, on any genre they want, for any platform. They're free to team up or make break and make teams all they want in order to get their game uh, finished from start uh, to finish. And sometimes I feel like with the way that the internet is going, that allows people to be anywhere, join dozens of communities, follow thousands of developers, watch hundreds of videos, but basically belong in nowhere in particular, right? The internet connects you to just about everyone else in the world, but at the same time, it sort of, it sort of smooths out a lot of these sort of uh, groupings and cultural differences that might form from 
stronger limitations. And there's not enough time. There's just not enough time in our industry. Our industry is relatively young. It started uh, roughly you know, 50 years ago, 50, 75 years ago. And even some of the people in our industry now uh, were kind of there in the beginning. So we haven't really had those huge generational turnovers yet. Uh, but more specifically, it takes many, many years to make a video game. And when we're talking about the kind of concentrated environment that you need creative back and forth, if it takes years to just say, hey, I like that thing, let me give you a remix on it, or let me twist it a little way, like years, then there really is no effective creative back and forth. We're just these separate individual creative efforts that kind of pop up and then enter the market, not really a conversation. Um, and on the flip side, games take way too many hours to play. So even if somebody did try to say, hey, I made this game in direct response, what do you think about it? Are you gonna have time to put in 10, 20, 50, 100 hours to play these things? And then there's just so many games in the industry, it really starts to work against us because of the, uh, the medium itself. And this final one, no service. In our current industry, there's a lot of factors that I consider to work against our ability to serve each other. And some of them include that game design as an art is not really well taught in the industry. It's fairly underrepresented in our universities and even game studies in universities is underrepresented across many universities in the US. Our discourse, the way we talk about games, the language that we use, it's scattered, it's confused, it's weak. Uh, we don't really have an effective shared language to really talk about some specific, deep, precise, nuanced things about games. Where it's, our conversation is really just shallow overall. Um, companies themselves have NDAs and other restrictions that prevent people from talking about how games are made or what they were thinking. It's really hard to figure out who did what in a game in terms of credits or creative attribution, uh, especially considering games are made over such a long period of time and that their actual process is so uh, complex, uh, improvisational even, that it's hard to pinpoint that. And games are so complex anyway, it's just really hard to help each other. If one developer is working on uh, balancing frame data in a fighting game and another developer is working on an MMO with their net code, they really don't have anything to share with each other. And considering how vast and complex games are, that's an issue in itself. So if this is the current state of our industry, this image that you see here, then the situation is even more limited for black designers. Black designers in the game industry make up about 2 to 6% of the video game industry. And there are various stats and various reportings on this, but really the numbers aren't good. So for any situation that might be, you know, difficult to form in terms of the industry as a whole, Black people have virtually no chance to, to have those three elements of the recipe uh, create the kind of environment that they can actually create these cultural expressive uh, mechanics reflective of their own personal histories. So the video game industry is missing these key elements and the medium itself and the technology wave that we ride, everything about what video games are, it kind of resists fixing this problem. We're not trending closer together. Uh, Twitter and social media and everything is just showing that we're moving further and further away and being a little bit more disconnected and a little bit less uh, grounded and, and intentional Then that is why there is no such thing as black mechanics yet. So consider this. I'm the younger brother, so I have lived my entire life uh, with my brother, and we have been playing video games since I was three years old. And we've been a team ever since. We've been talking about video games, making video games, playing video games, just about everything. And this is an interesting case to consider because we have been this sort of force, this, this team that have stayed within these boundaries for my entire life. I'm 34 years old now. Uh, so we have the time factor, we have the limitation factor. And when you consider that when we started making games, we just really made them for each other. Whether it's just this funny idea, like what if we took Makoto from Street Fighter and put her in Mega Man 9, right? And have her play with her punches and kicks in a game where you normally shoot. Whether we created these weird games on the side that test our ability, our different skills and various aspects or my latest project, Enlighten, which I've created a game, and I wanted to share my love for puzzle games with my brother and my friends, and I wanted to say, like, hey, by playing this game, I think I'm going to get across this, this why I love puzzle games so much, and if you play it, maybe you can get a lot closer to understanding where I'm coming from. We, we made these games for each other, and very much this fulfills the service sort of requirement And when we're talking about that recipe for creating a cultural art. So, maybe we have a decent example for what it looks like to develop a black mechanic and 
we in the game that we worked on, uh, Bari Bari Ball, which is started by Noah Sasso, and we join the team and we make up the three primary uh, designers. It's a strange flavor right there. Um, we created this mechanic called English. And in Bari Bari Ball, it's the ability to precisely control the amount of force that's applied to the ball when you attack it. Um, we have a long history of playing sports. When we were kids, we played soccer, uh, we played baseball, we played some uh, basketball. And when we were literally on the court shooting hoops, we were talking about game design and kind of working through the, what we wanted out of this game. We came up with this idea for English. And we were basically thinking, when we shoot a basketball, we have all this control over the spin and over the, the speed and all that. Like, I want this kind of control inside of the game. It just doesn't feel right as a game that's like a half sport, half fighting game to not have this precise control over the ball. So that's pretty much how English was created. And it really does reflect our personal history with sports and the things that we like in video games. But to develop black mechanics, we needed to include more people than just us. So we basically created this company called Design Oriented. And we're a company, uh, we're a learning community actually that focuses on game design and related skills. We teach game design through this communal learning uh, style, and we also created a curriculum. You know, this entire curriculum on game design right here, so that we could be able to communicate and teach other people the art of game design. And we formed this community in order to help others. Uh, what I love about it is we're mostly on the Discord. We get free advice and free consulting and free feedback, and it's it's all just our ability to reach out and help other people because we wanted them to have uh, a really constructive and effective environment to learn about games. And while the Discord is fun and it works and it's great, um, just like I said before, the internet naturally doesn't bring people together and have them hunker down and stick with limitations. People love to float away and to kind of sample a lot of different sources and, and bounce around. So it was difficult to create the kind of concentrated environment uh, that a cultural art could, could be created. But we created the Mario Maker Workshop on the flip side, and we said, okay, why don't we limit everything to just Mario Maker 2? Why don't we just try to focus on level design? Why don't we create a community that works for itself instead of just or for each other in the community rather than just for each individual themselves? And we ran this course for 23 weeks, right? Learning level design one week at a time. And I believe that the Mario Maker Workshop is just a really good case for why this cultural recipe is so powerful. Uh, we created this environment where everyone's friends and we could all learn, we could all uh, feel free to make mistakes, we could all riff off of each other. The turnaround was really quick. We had enough time to really just get used to each other and we had the, the limitations and the structure to make it all happen. And it was a ton of fun, right? The Mario Maker Workshop, you can see it there for yourself, but I believe this is a strong case for why this formula is so powerful. So to wrap it all up, I really wish I could tell you the vision that I have for the future of the gaming industry. Like, I don't have a lot of time in this talk, but uh, there's so much going on in my head and there's so much that we discuss that design oriented on a daily basis. I wish I had time to share that all with you. I wish I could show you how we learn the particular way that we weave transparency and community together uh, in a curriculum to teach game design. And I wish I could tell you more about the Mario Maker Workshop. That's a whole talk in itself. I didn't couldn't and didn't fit into this talk in particular. Uh, I wish I could tell you about the innovative ideas that we cooked up. I wish I could tell you that the things that we're talking about putting in the games is like nothing you've ever seen before. You'll never see it coming. Um, but ultimately, an interesting question of why there's no such thing as black mechanics yet, it's basically because uh, we still need help launching a new kind of game design school. So we've, we've done a lot of research, We've experimented, we've tested it on our own community, and we really believe we have something special here. So uh, if you're interested in this kind of thing at all, if you're curious uh, whatsoever, consider following us, uh, joining us, helping us out, telling us your stories, because I'm really curious to know how we can sort of turn the tide in this industry that's really not moving in the direction that allows Black mechanics to exist. Here are some of the interesting credits. I recommend everybody take a look at some of these YouTube videos and Netflix if you have it, High on the Hog, it's an amazing series. I learned a lot in every single episode and every single scene. Um, and if you want to know more about how to contact me in particular, here are my contacts. Uh, I really enjoyed making this talk and I, it's a pleasure to get to talk and share these ideas with you. If you're inspired, if you want to know more about it, you know where to find me. But until next time, guys, thank you for listening.